Coming up on this week in computer hardware, so much IDF, Skylake Deets, the Crosspoint Octane Tech, DX12 Benchmarks, NVIDIA's N50 is the new 750Ti, 6 terabyte hard drives, and beginner's guide to liquid nitrogen coolant. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 329, recorded August 20th, 2015, NVIDIA Zen 50 and Inside Skylake. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Get $10 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash Twitch. Welcome to This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most delightful, and occasionally even the most incredibly satisfying hardware news in the world of technology. Joining me as always, except when we're traveling, Mr. Ryan Trout, recently back from the Moscone Center Intel Developer Forum 2015 Madness. Correct. Where I am sure he was given a firm date for the availability of the Skylake, much coveted Skylake i7 6700K. Do we have a date? Um, yes. The future. Nah. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, I asked several people about it, and most people were kind of um, non-committal. Uh, and one person... Uh, Basically, all the answers were, oh, next week, oh, next week. Uh, one person at least kind of gave me an off-the-record answer of, um, you know, we were, we were going to bring them to market, and one very large customer wanted to buy it. Like, I was, it was kind of like, why did they come out early, and then why uh, are they hard to find now? What's the point of all that? And he was kind of like, well, you know, as it turns out, when you have a very big customer that says, I want to buy X number of these, and it has million at the end of it, but I need them by this date, and they're not selling them. They're for, like, internal use stuff. You just kind of go, okay, and you make it happen when you can. So that may help explain some of the lack of inventory availability, but the need to release it and launch it at an earlier time frame than they maybe would have wanted to. So um, I think I saw that I... No, maybe I was wrong. I thought I saw somebody say something that they actually had them in stock for a short period of time at Newegg. Um, no, still isn't as coming soon here. But uh, hey, you still get that 6600K, Patrick. I know that's, what's, that's what you're really aiming for, right? No. No, it's not. <laughs> First new processor for me and my like gaming, a video editor, yeah. rendering laptop. Yeah. I am not settling for a car 56600, though it would deliver a healthy boost over my long suffering Core i7 920. But if I'm going to spend $250, I'm going to spend the other $100. Unless you've got Core i5-600 benchmarks that say that, like, it's within, you know, most... If if it's got, like, 80% of the performance for two-thirds of the price, I'm all over the Core i5-6600. But I haven't seen any benchmarks on them yet, so... Um, I haven't either. I mean, we could we could get pretty close to emulate it by just turning off hyper-threading. I think you'll find that um, for a lot of benchmarks, they're going to be very similar. It's just when you get into the more highly threaded stuff... Uh, video encoding or rendering or or something like that. Or uh, maybe when we get into the world of, of DirectX 12 games that you may start to see some some difference in performance across those two parts. So I, so. I would, if, if I were you, I would just wait. It's a hundred bucks. It may be a week. It may be two weeks. You know what? You've waited this long. What's another 14 to 21 days, right? I just want to know who bought that many processors. I don't know. They wouldn't tell me. And isn't actually selling them uh, to the public. Like, yeah, I, are you, or, it's a or, valid I, question. Now I'm going to want to go search like Dell and Lenovo and maybe it's Vio, the revive, the reconstituted Vio. <laughs> They're going to, yeah, hopefully the they would be buying stuff to sell though. They need to sell things for sure. So, oh my goodness. So let's talk about uh, Skylake processor architecture. Part of the, probably the biggest deal at IDF was at least for you and me and, and people who love hardware was the fact that Intel launched Skylake did squat about the architecture the least amount possible to send out review parts, which I think drove you absolutely beside yourself with irritation. Uh, 
Skyleak's been been released. Scaling from tablets to servers, which sounds like an ARM pitch uh, by way of Tegra, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. So it talks about having parts that range from four and a half watts up to ninety one watts, and I imagine they'll actually go higher than that. Ninety one watts is what this Core i seven sixty seven hundred K is at. They'll have Xeon parts based on Skylake that will be higher than that, and we'll eventually get Skylake E. Um, and it's really also no surprise to go down to 4.5 watts because uh, Broadwell Y, also known as the Core M processor, also kind of went down to like the 4.5 watt range. Um, so it's really this, the same envelope. Uh, but it was interesting to listen to a couple of the actual architects on the Israeli design team that were responsible for it talk about, you know, this is a five-year design cycle for us. You know, they're, they're kind of segmenti segmented internally, right? The Broadwell team is separate from the Skylake team, which was separate from the Haswell team. They're all kind of working in tandem and they share a lot of resources, right? But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, they're all kind of responsible for their own project. Uh, and they talked about, um, you know, five years ago being with, presented with, okay, build us a 25 and a 95 watt part. And then, you know, a year in they go, okay, you know, actually let's make that 15 watts also. And then like another year in going, yeah, as it turns out, the market's changed. We're going to need you to make a 4.5 watt derivative. <laughs> of that as well. Um, so uh, engine, the engineering challenges sounded, sounded pretty, pretty exceptional, I guess, uh, from, from that point of view, but you're right that, that, you know, interesting stories aside, other than a couple of really key points, they didn't dive too much into what is really, uh, powering the Skylake architecture. And, and I think maybe a lot of that is the truth behind it is, is it's just very similar. Like we got to remember that these architecture designs are very iterative and they have been really since, since Sandy bridge, um, mm -hmm. like Sandy bridge to Ivy bridge or more, more like Sandy bridge to Haswell, very similar, you know, Haswell kind of adds this integrated voltage regulator, uh, and a couple of other things. Skylake actually removes that. Uh, but you can see here, yeah, that, that table is a good, good kind of visual of small changes that happen in those architecture shifts. Remember that Ivy Bridge and Broadwell yeah. are uh, ticks, not talks, or the other way around. I don't remember which. Um, and all, if you don't know what any of those numbers mean, uh, out-of-order windows, in-flight loads, in-flight stores, schedule entries, register files, they're basically uh, how many spaces the processor has in order to store data uh, for the out of order execution, which basically allows it to reorganize instructions to uh, better improve throughput on a clock for clock basis. So the more kind of instructions you can have in flight that you could, uh, you know, imagine picking and choosing from to do them in the right order. So they happen the most efficiently, I guess, is what that is. And so that's kind of where you get your IPC, your instruction per clock improvement. Um, and and the, the, you know, the, the, the story that everybody knows, but doesn't want to talk about is, for x86 out of order processors, it's kind of there don't appear to be any major milestones left in that arena, right? We've seen GPU performance scale tremendously, and uh, CPU performance is scaling relatively slowly. Um, they change other stuff. They modified branch predictors, uh, wider instruction buffers, uh, shorter latencies. They've done a bunch of other things that we don't really need to get into in here that, you know, minor tweaks and modifications from Haswell to Skylake uh, that, that kind of improve things. Uh, there are two things that I would consider that they did on the architecture that really stand out to me. One is the interconnected memory changes. So there's a, there's a ring bus that is inside the processor that basically facilitates communication between the CPU cores individually, the GPU portion, um, the system agent, which was responsible for memory uh, and um, connection to like PCI Express and all that. That bus is kind of like how data gets cycled between all those components internally. The bandwidth on that interconnect has been doubled. Uh, you know, part of that is because of, well, we've got DDR4 now, we need to make more room for that. Uh, right. We're, we're going to have more SKUs that have this large ED RAM cache on board. So we want to make room for that. Uh, and we also, I think they're kind of making, uh, improving that bandwidth will help with six, eight, 12 core processors down the line, right? So um, kind of allowing for, for faster communication internally. And the interesting thing was, is when you go back to the part where we're talking about where we had to test it without knowing about the architecture, if you looked at cache performance, on uh, on Skylake, it was higher. Like it scaled higher than anything else in the mm -hmm. 
in the design. You're like, well, that's kind of weird. I wonder why that happened or how that happened. And now we finally know the answer. So while as before, we just kind of talked blindly. Now we can actually say uh, uh, why. And then uh, the EDRAM, that picture that you're bringing up there, shows the changes they made there. They're going to have more parts that have that 128 meg of onboard cache EDRAM, which is great. That was the, we, on Broadwell, those were all Iris Pro parts, right? That's what all was branded as. Uh, I think it'll still have the Iris Pro branding on Skylake. They're going to offer more SKUs with it, but as of now, I don't think they're going to offer a like desktop part using mm -hmm. that. Um, at least they didn't indicate that they had any plans for it, which is a little disappointing. Right. But they modified that. They moved the controller onto the system agent so it can be more efficient. It can talk to the other components on the chip without having to go through uh, another layer of cache. It allows uh, you know, power-saving feature like storing the frame buffer in EDRAM and, and being able to draw the frame buffer from that as opposed to having to go wake up the rest of the processor to, to draw it from internal cache that way. Um, so, the I mean, that's EDRAM, pretty neat. Yeah, the EDRAM stuff looked really interesting where they're finally, you know, they're making multiple variations on the EDRAM, or say EDRAM Plus, and that they can now include it in more parts, and it'll be yep. for CPU caching, and not just GPU caching. Right, uh, right. Which is why we, yeah. we, why we want to see it on desktop parts, right? right. Uh, and maybe, maybe they think, you know, the desktop users don't really care about that. We'll see it on, like, Xeon parts or server class parts that maybe would have um, more tuned workloads to take advantage of something like that. 128 megs of cache is, is a huge amount of cache, right? So uh, most workloads uh, for the consumer space aren't, aren't going to handle that. The other interesting feature that they've added uh, from my point of view, is something called Intel Speed Shift Technology. And this is a feature that is not enabled today. It requires operating system uh, implementation. And so Windows 10 will support it, but it doesn't have support in there for it today. <clears throat> the basic idea is in a system today with Haswell or any other processor, you have a thing called a P-state, which is a performance state. And the, the operating system and the CPU work together to determine what your P-state should be and thus what the clock speed should be, right? So if the, if the operating system says, hey, we're doing this workload, it needs all the performance you've got, go to P0. I think it's that, or maybe it's the other way around, maybe it's P6. But, you know, go to the highest performance P state mm -hmm. and uh, give me all the frequency you can. Or, okay, we're at a modest workload, give me, you know, P state three or, or you know, go down to P0 or idle, um, something like that. Uh, that is how the, you, you know, when you watch your frequency change, in your on your CPU in your Windows box, that's what you're seeing is is the operating system telling the CPU, hey, change this, change that. With speed shift, Intel is moving that logic onto the processor itself, so that the CPU will be able to take a little bit of direction from uh, the operating system, more like a range of P states that it can be in. Mm -hmm. But then internally, it looks at how much its componentry is loaded, how much you know, certain resources are being utilized and it will adjust the frequency on its own. The advantages of that is that it can have like an infinite number of P-states and that the those transitions between P-states are like 30 times faster because it doesn't have to wait for the... So the, an example would be uh, if you're using a tablet or a touchscreen laptop and you touch the screen, you have to wait for the Windows operating system to recognize the touch, recognize that it is an action that needs high performance, like scrolling an image very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. communicate to the processor that this needs to happen, the processor speeds up, and thus it filters back into your performance. Um, that would kind of be bypassed with, with uh, uh, these speed shift transitions, right? Where it would kind of, it would right. more quickly get up to that higher speed. Um, and so you'll see, I, we, we can't talk about like uh, clock speeds of anything yet, but you'll see, I think what you'll see is very modest base clock speeds and very, very, high, very, very high turbos for short periods of time in order to kind of give the, I guess the term everybody likes to use is like snappiness to experiences mm -hmm. on Windows 10. So uh, I think that, I think that'll be pretty interesting um, for, for what it can do for the architecture. It seems like they're, they're kind of not as interested in overall performance and much more interested in smaller things that implement the user, I should say, influence the, influ the user, experience, user experience in a lot of subtle ways. It, uh, it is. That's, that, that's really where they're focused on, especially if you look at like low wattage parts. So if you take like uh -huh. a 4 or even a 15 watt CPU, like a lot of the benchmarks that we're used to running are um, sustained workloads. 
uh, right. three D rendering, video transcoding, uh, huge file zips or uh, compressions and decompressions or in, uh, encryptions and things like that. But in reality, uh, those are very few and far between yeah. instances people of people don't. using systems. Most people are like, Most I want to scroll. The, I want to scroll up, I, and I want yeah. the, the screen to react quickly to me. And so they're kind of focusing on that. And the problem for them that they they're working through now is like, how do you prove that? How do you demonstrate that right. as opposed to just saying it's snappy? Well, it's funny because you know there there have been times where where there have been immense changes made. You know, Windows actually is one of the most notable places where they rearchitected the way. Uh, you know, windows opened or closed or expanded just because they realized, you know, by, by taking teams of like anthropologists and psychologists, you know, and analyzing people, you know, staring at monitors to figure out very small things that made the system feel much faster despite the fact that it wasn't actually doing anything any faster, you know, kind of like the magician waving the hand over here, so you don't <laughs> notice what they're doing over here, which sounds ridiculous, but it can dramatically influence, you know, how you're working experiences on the device and it's funny because okay so yes i want the new core i7 6700k because i actually do sit down and i take a you know three gigabyte video file and i need to turn it into a 300 megabyte video file as fast as possible and i can't upload it or go home until it's done so <laughs> you know yeah. i have friends that are that are video editing on like, you know, Haswell systems that are 30% overclocked because we discovered that by overclocking it by 30%, we cut down the render times, you know, by like 30% or 25% or something ridiculous like that. And, you know, uh, you know, Adobe Premiere operated considerably better for them, which is a big deal, right? Because if you edit video 40 hours a week and suddenly, you know, it takes you 10 minutes less every two hours to edit something and half as much time or, you know, 30% less time to render it so you can send it to the client, that's more work you can do in a week and more money you can make. But most of us are like, I want the web page to load faster, which was funny because I was, I was some of this, we reviewed uh, Leva's X2. Uh, it's a new like $179 mini PC vase mount on the back on tech thing. And, and one of my thoughts was that, you know, I could feel web pages loading. The web pages were, were loading slower than they would on my Core i5 system. And then, you know, once I used it for a couple hours and I was kind of used to the pace of things, it didn't really bother me at all. But, you know, going the other way is always really exciting for consumers. And also, I'm wondering if they're trying to just fight their way down, like, okay, we can't beat ARM, but maybe we can take our, our you know, our processors, our x86 processors, and make them so fast and so compelling and use so little wattage. You know, people would be foolish not to start considering for them for tablets. Like, if Intel's just going to grind their way down to power consumption so low on the x86 processor lineup that they actually become viable alternatives to ARM for for phones. Uh, I don't know. It's it's because <laughs> certainly their ARM competitors haven't worked the way they would want them to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yep. You're right. Oh my goodness. Uh, Intel Skylake Gen Nine. Graphics architecture. It's another write-up you did while you were at EDF this week. Um, it was... Sorry. Box just came down in the warehouse. I wanted to make sure it wasn't on top of somebody. The... Uh, <laughs> It's crazy. Um, the, the the GPU die is is or takes up as much, basically the GPU takes up as much space on the die as the CPU, uh, and that's the other thing I'm wondering if if Intel is finally going to beat both Nvidia and AMD to death by slowly ratcheting up graphics performance because they've certainly ratcheted up uh, uh, graphics complexity in a pretty insane way. Uh, if you look yeah. at the memory and I/O interface, that's a whole lot of graphics on a chip manufacturer, you know, on a CPU manufacturers mm -hmm. die. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this. The The interesting sure. thing about the, the Gen 9 graphics uh, uh, implementation, which is what we'll, you'll find on Skylake, is that it basically adds a little bit more flexibility for uh, the chip designers and implementation to kind of have more unique SKUs. Right, so they've changed the naming scheme. It's it's a three digit number now, like the Intel HD five thirty is what's on the Core i seven sixty seven hundred K. It is a twenty four execution unit uh, implementation of the Gen nine graphics, but they they claim in this white paper that you can actually go up to three full slices, which would be seventy two execution units. Um, 
I don't know if they're going to have a SKU that actually has that because that would be a huge, I mean, that would be triple the the die space for, right. eh, it'd probably be more like double the die space necessary uh, to actually implement that on, on a processor. So that would have to be like a very specific use case. Um, but we do expect there to be at least a two-slice implementation. That's kind of how it existed on Broadwell. You had GT2 and GT3, um, and, and I think we'll see the same type of thing uh, with, with Skylake. But the, the functionality of being able to make kind of more customized parts, and we've already talked about the changes to the ED RAM and, and how it functions a little bit differently. Uh, it can act more as a general purpose cache. It also helps... Uh, Intel for that that kind of move to the heterogeneous computing environment where CPU and GPU are sharing threads and they're sharing data and they don't have to go through this very power hungry process of copying data between caches and it's right. it's slow and power hungry at the same time which is like a double double negative for for what you actually want in processor design. Um, this will do significantly better in that. They talk a little bit about uh, in the white paper. Uh, about the, the the interconnect, the ring bus changing as well. Uh, and we also talk about, let's see, they give some numbers here in terms of, it was interesting, the white paper was written before the final clock speeds of the Core i7 6700K. So the, rather than give you full, like, raw gigaflops of theoretical compute performance, they just basically told you how much compute you had per cycle, and then you had to do the math on your own because they're like, well, we don't really know where it's going to be clocked at. So at 1.15 gigahertz, uh, the Intel HD 530 has a peak throughput of 441.6 single precision gigaflops. Um, that is, so that, I mean, it's a, it's a solid number, but you got to remember if you compare it to discrete cards, it is, it's less than a GeForce GT 730 discrete GPU. Uh, and it's about half of what AMD's Kaveri APU does with 840 right gigaflops of uh, theoretical compute. So this is not the highest end Intel graphics implementation that there will be. I expect when we see Skylake on uh, H-series parts, uh, mobile parts, that uh, we'll, we'll see those larger implementations. Maybe we'll get something closer. I'm guessing 700, 750 gigaflops will kind of be where we see mobile graphics on there. And, you know, then we'll actually have some competition. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, not a whole lot other than that in terms of what actually changed is in Gen 9 designs. I'm trying to look through here. L3 cache sizes are changing. They go from 512 to 768 kilobytes uh, per slice, but um, very much similar to previous designs to Haswell in that regard. Nothing wrong with that. Also, nothing wrong with the announcements uh, Intel made about Optane technology, which... Uh, I just wonder who names all this stuff inside of Intel. They either love the job or hate it. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, Intel Micron released uh, 3D crosspoint technology, spelled X-point. Uh, Two-layer stack of non-volatile memory that couples the data retention of NAND memory flash with speeds much closer to that of DRAM. This is good, right? Because it's like DRAM performance but non-volatile, so the information doesn't go away when you shut your system down. Awesome. Sounds amazing. Faster than an SSD, practically as fast as your system memory. It's going to be awesome. Um, you know, the density is kind of ridiculous. Uh, um, you know, like 8 to 10 times greater density than DRAM, which means you, you in the space of, of 1 gigabyte of DRAM, you're getting like 9 gigabytes of 3D X-point storage. That's a big yep. deal, right? If you're yep. thinking about thumb drives and stuff. You know, it's faster. It's denser. You know, uh, it's probably going to cost a fortune. Well, uh, Ryan, uh, you, this is awesome because, you know, one of the things Ryan saw at, at IDF was uh, that they're going to start with, you know, data center storage, big massive servers, and work their way down to Ultrabooks, which means, and I will quote, that Crosspoint must come in at a cost per gigabyte closer to NAND than to DRAM. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, the performance is ridiculous uh, compared to NAND. <laughs> you know, yeah, they showed yeah they feet. showed one 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 benchmark essentially during a keynote um, yeah. that cycled between Q depths and stuff like that. So you're talking about anywhere if they showed anywhere from 5.5 to 7.2 um, x the performance of the fastest NAND drive mm -hmm. that Intel makes today the the SSD DCP 3700. So yeah, 
That's pretty freaking awesome. Yep, and I think that implementation was being tested on an add-in card version of it, and they also talked about uh, what they're going to offer is DIM-based versions of this for server environments. So, you know, direct connect into the CPU architecture through it. So, what's wrong with that? Which is probably where you get more of those thousand x improvements that they're quoting. Well. And hey. We'll just add another spec that works on the uh, M.2 <laughs> slot. <laughs> yep. Because it's flexible that way. T4 yep. CTX 950. Is this the new 750 Ti or, or is there enough of a performance? Because basically it's now priced where the 750 Ti used to be. Is there enough of a performance boost? I mean, what are we looking there's, at benchmark-wise? There's a significant performance boost from the 750 Ti to the 950, but the 750 Ti will continue on. It's just at a lower price. It's like you can right. buy it for 99 bucks now. Um, but they're 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 fairly different segmented products, right? Like the 750 Ti was billed as this super efficient. You don't need external power connections at all. You can upgrade your 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 desktop OEM system that is really bad at PC gaming. Um, and not spend a lot of money or have to upgrade your power supply, et cetera, to do it. The 950 is much more like the 650 was or uh, the 650 Ti uh, or the 960 in that it is, it's just a lower power card. It still requires a six pin power connector. Um, and it, it is it's built on the same GPU as the GTX 960. It just, instead right. of having 1,024 enabled cores, it has 768 enabled cores and a slightly lower rated clock speed across the board. Um, its performance is kind of exactly where you expected it to be. It's like 15% right. slower than the GTX 960, but it's about 25 to 30% faster than a GTX 750 Ti. Um, the other interesting comparison is from the AMD side, you have the Radeon R7 370, which is kind of like the closest price competitor to the new 950. And it is based on the Pitcairn GPU that was released as the Radeon HD 7850, which was then released as the Radeon R9 280, and now is the Radeon R7 370. I think that's the, the pathway it took. It's an old part. Right. It loses by anywhere from 15 to 25% as well to the 950. Uh, it lacks a significant amount of features compared to the 950. It doesn't support HDMI 2. doesn't support variable refresh technology from AMD. doesn't support FreeSync. Uh, it doesn't um, do XDMA crossfire, for example. Um, it's just old and long in the tooth, like much of AMD's R300 you know, series of parts really is. Um, right. And... I don't know if they'll adjust the price on it or if they're just going to kind of leave it where it is and, and, and trust that people will just buy to buy at that price point. But it mm -hmm. probably should come down and be a little bit less expensive than the 950 if it wants to, to kind of be in the right uh, uh, segment when you look at, at, at comparable product stacks. Um, the 950 also has, as I look through here, um, <clears throat> they did an interesting thing, right? So... MOBA, all the rage, right? Dota 2, League of Legends. Everybody wants to get a piece of that of that uh, uh, that money that's floating around there, right? And NVIDIA is billing the GTX 950 as like the perfect card for MOBA gamers. They did a lot of work uh, through GeForce Experience to specifically tune the GTX 950 for Dota 2 at 1080p. They looked at what's the most popular game they can target, what's the most popular resolution they can target, and they spent a lot of time doing some some interesting things like changing options in the control panel that most people have probably never heard of, like uh, maximum pre-rendered frames. And the default setting for NVIDIA cards has forever been two with a single card and three with SLI. Uh, right. Turns out for Dota 2, you can set that to one and you shave four to eight milliseconds off of your uh, game render loop, right? And the, the pre-rendered frame setting kind of lowers what your maximum frame rate can be. But in that specific game, they decided that uh, it makes more sense to target the, the bare minimum frame rate because it is a competitive game, you know, like as in for money competitions uh, and people are trying to get that extra edge in that way. They've done some things like they found out that Dota 2, even if you have 144 hertz monitor and it's set to 144 hertz in Windows, defaults to a 60 hertz refresh rate when you play the game. So 
they were able to use GeForce Experience to like update that, push up to 100 or 120 um, hertz. So you get, again, another slight improvement in what your total frame render time or frame from click to display time will actually be. Now, the secret is you can do all that stuff manually. You can right. go in the control panel. You can change that setting. You can go into the game if you recognize it and change the refresh rate from 60 to 100 or 120 or whatever. Uh, and you can change the game settings manually if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, but And you can do that with any card. You don't even have to have a, a GTX 950 to do it. But NVIDIA is kind of targeting this market. They're, they're, I think they're basically testing how much deeper can we get on setting adjustments for games using their kind of automated system and their automated uh, uh, settings optimizations. It's right. a lot more work for them to do it. So they're kind of starting with, let's start with this extremely popular game with this extremely popular video card, at least that they hope that it will be, and uh, and go from there. And at a price of $160 to $170, depending on if you get a custom overclocked model, I think mm -hmm. they will sell a lot of these, these GPUs for sure. Good news. It was interesting. I, I almost expected more of a gap between the 950 and the 960 on most of the benchmarks. But Yeah. And, <laughs> and the, the problem is there, like, currently, like, the 960 is only, like, 10 to $20 more than the 950. So I, I would say in a lot of ways that if I were, if you're going out and you're buying it at launch time, mm -hmm. you know, actually, yeah, so it says 20 bucks there. But depending on, like, where, where sales are at and rebates are at, you may sure. find that the uh, the 960 was going to be very, very close to the 950. And if that's the case, just get the, 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 the faster card. So. <laughs> Just buy the faster card, people. Yeah. You'll thank Ryan later. DX, G, DX, G, GX12, uh, GPU and CPU performance tested. Ashes of the Singularity benchmark. Um, is this the first DX12 game that's really worth benchmarking on? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's the second DX12 benchmark we've had. Mm -hmm. It is the first based on a real game. The game's not out yet, um, but the game will be out relatively soon. And it's based on a real game engine for a real game that will be out. So, so it is, in my opinion, the first true DX12 benchmark to come out. Uh, the results are actually pretty interesting. We tested a five CPU, two GPU, two resolutions, two preset, two API collection of data there, which I think is 80 different data points that are presented. Um, this, I, I really would encourage people to go watch the video or read the story on this because it can get fairly complex about how the benchmark works and what the controversy is between NVIDIA and AMD when it comes to that. The short version of it is that uh, we tested DX11 and DX12. In the DX11 results, it showed that NVIDIA's driver is way ahead of what AMD's driver is today, which explains a whole lot about how... Uh, where how performance exists today on DX11 games, why NVIDIA tends right. to be better in a lot of areas than AMD does. Uh, not, not being said, when you go to DirectX 12 mode, the scores between the GTX 980 and the 390X are very similar. They uh, kind of homogenize. They, they kind of normalize out, which means as a result, the NVIDIA scores go up a little bit in some cases, while the AMD scores go up a lot in most cases. Right. So some people will take this as AMD's drivers are better. AMD has been preparing for DirectX 12 forever. They're finally getting it. All that work they put in on Mantle is, is paying dividends. Other mm -hmm. people will look at it as like, well, AMD did so poorly with DirectX 11 that anything they did with DirectX 12 was going to show these massive improvements. And honestly, I don't really know what the answer is. We won't mm -hmm. know until we see a couple of more data points, like other games that come out or right. benchmarks that come out under DirectX 12 that will tell us if... Did AMD just really target this game engine because this game engine was written on Mantle and was one of AMD's partners for a long time? Or is it that DirectX 12 kind of gives everybody this even footing to start with? Uh, and I think it will be really compelling to see how that happens or how that goes for the rest of the year because there, there are several more DirectX 12 games and benchmarks due out before the end of the year. So we'll, we'll start to get more information there. It is early, people, and things will change. About sums yep. it up. Very possible. We should take. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say we should take a moment to thank our sponsor, Ring.com. Do you, sir? I am led to understand you have a Ring doorbell mounted. I on do. Your home. I do. Yes, and I use it often, as it turns out. <laughs> what are you uh, doing for example, with the Ring for example, um, 
I was in San Francisco attending the Intel Developer Forum. And I was in the lobby area in the elevator bank. And uh, my phone beeps at me and it says, somebody's at your door. <sighs> and I pick up the phone, I swipe up, and it shows me that it's a FedEx guy standing outside the front door. And I hit answer. And I go, okay. I said, hey, uh, this is Ryan. And they're like, oh, this FedEx got a package for you. And uh, I say, well, I'm not there right now, but somebody will be there very soon. So I'm not there to sign. Can you just leave the package for me and uh, do an authorization that way? And he said, yeah, I can do that. And he left the package at the door and somebody came up and, you know, Ken or Alan showed up and, and brought it inside the office later. Had I not had the ring doorbell, I would have missed that delivery and uh, I would have been very upset. And that's, I mean, and, and that's like... That's just like the one thing, you know, that, that I'm using it for. There's, there's security reasons to have it. Right. Um, there's convenience reasons to have it. For example, I might want to have it for if uh, Kelly's upstairs feeding the baby and somebody rings the doorbell downstairs. Right. She can look on her phone and see if it's like a, a marketing guy or a kid trying to sell me pizza coupons or something. <laughs> and then she can make the decision to either ignore or accept uh, that invitation of human interaction if she wants without having to go face to face or go open the door and figure out, uh, figure out what it is. So, uh, <laughs> so I, that's, it, that, those to me are some of the interesting options for it. You know, it literally is, it's a doorbell with a camera built into it. It runs off of your, your doorbell wiring, uh, or yep. you can use a built in rechargeable battery, which lasts an extraordinarily long time. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, you can get $10 off of the Ring video doorbell when you go to ring.com slash Twitch and uh, take advantage of the ability to figure out just exactly who is standing in front of your door uh, without I, having it, to leave the comfort of your couch, bedroom, yeah. nursing chair, lactating room, <laughs> bar, video game, or anything else. <laughs> if you have a connection to the internet, you can know exactly what's going on yeah. when your door It was easy open. to install. Um, we're running it off the battery and it's... I don't know how long we've had it installed, but it's, it's been a while and I haven't haven't had any issues. Like it's never been needed to be recharged or anything yet. Uh, and I even got one of the accessories for it. I bought the um, the Ring Chime, which is an add-on that you just plug into anywhere else in your house that's on the same network right. and you configure it. And it basically rings when somebody hits the doorbell as well. Yeah, that thing right there. So if you're upstairs and maybe you can't hear the door chime, like, so if you if you have a regular doorbell, and you hook it up to it, it will ring your normal doorbell. But if you don't, like here, where right. we did, it was a new installation, it, it emits a sound. But if you're back here, music's playing, you don't hear it. Um, so you just, I just plugged one into the back room and set it up. And now when the doorbell rings, it rings as well. So we get a little extra notification nice. uh, that it's working. So you can put multiple of those in your house or one in your basement if you're often down there doing woodworking. I don't know. Something like that. Working in the basement. Have you used the night vision LEDs yet? Uh, I have not. No. Um, you have a homework but, assignment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if there's ever a homeless guy like sleeping inside the thing at night, I guess I'll be able to see that then. So that would be, I don't know. and I can answer it. Like, hey, could you please not do that? That'd be cool. Great. Thanks. I don't know if that would work. but Things are changing in Florence. <laughs> right now you get $10 off the normal price. Protect your home and have peace of mind with Ring. Go to ring.com slash twitch. That's ring.com slash twitch. We want to thank them for their support of this week in computer hardware. In our continuing efforts to bring some non-Intel news into the show today, <laughs> Western Digital launches 5 terabyte and 6-terabyte black and red pros. And while I know you're thinking, but... But Patrick, there's 16 terabyte SSDs that Samsung hasn't shipped yet that I'll have to sell my card to buy. Why would I care about blacks and reds being five and six terabytes? Well, in my case, because more storage in the NAS is always a good thing. Um, and it's funny, uh, Alan points out in the article on PC Per, the last time Western Digital really updated their black series of hard disk drives uh, was the four terabyte drives that came out two years ago. Um, so if you have a massive collection of games you want to store locally, this is a great way to do it. The, you know, the, the black drives are essentially desktop drives. The red drives are what you want to put in your servers or NAS boxes. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, you know, this, you're looking at something in the neighborhood of a 50% gain in capacity. You're going from 4 gigabyte reds to 6 terabyte reds to max out your system. Uh, 128 megabyte of cache and can peak at 214 megabytes per second, which would have sounded so awesome 
just a little while ago before SSD started getting really <laughs> stupid fast. <laughs> And they're not that expensive. Five terabyte black drive comes in at two hundred sixty four dollars. The six terabyte drive comes in at two hundred ninety four dollars. So that's pretty awesome if you need all of the yeah. storage in your machine. Uh, more of a rumor than an actual story. Microsoft Surface Pro Band Two and new Lumia is set for October launch event. This originally came out of a Chinese newspaper. The Verge claims to have uh, I, I want to say uh, independent verification. A source. Sources unnamed have confirmed uh, that there's going to be a, a new Surface Pro 4, which is, uh, I think we kind of already knew, the band new, but new Lumias, which is certainly shocking me. Um, I saw a, a PC Week article recently where Sasha Sagan, uh, whose cell phone reviews I dearly love, the men's amazing, uh, pointed out that as far as their phone uh, 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 direction goes, you know, uh, Microsoft seems to be swerving all over the road, uh, possibly like a drunk. I don't know if Sasha actually said that last part, but <laughs> Lumia 950 and 950 XL have been rumored for months. Notes The Verge and specifications for both handsets have already leaked. So, you know, we will find out. Everybody's pretty, but pretty positive about a, a Surface Pro 4. I think the really big question is, uh, what are the phones going to be, and how do they actually fit into the Windows 10 universe? Uh, and and does it you know is is Microsoft said they're not done with the phone platform, but you know I'll believe that when I actually see it, uh, especially given the next story on our rundown, uh, which is also a Verge story, but it was too cruel to not mention, which is that ninety six point eight percent of the new smartphones sold are either iPhone or Android devices. Uh, I was laughing, and somebody said, "What's so funny?" And I said, "It's because I thought the number would have been higher by now." Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, that said, you're still looking at something like uh, 8 million Windows phone being sold in the second quarter of 2014, right? Um, you know, but that's also compared to 243 million Android phones and 35 million, you know, iPhones. So Android has the volume. iOS has the revenue for developers. And Windows uh, is significantly outselling BlackBerry by a factor of four. Um, <laughs> that's a but, fairly significant uh, amount yes yeah uh, Gartner suggests writes the verge that this constantly booming industry might finally be reaching maturity even as the growth spring Chinese market has reached saturation its phone market is essentially driven by replacement um, so you know global smartphone sales I guess it's these the, the, it's funny it sounds so like the PC industry that is because Growth is now slowed to thirteen point five percent. So I, I sense a lot of affordable phones coming up, especially as the the mobile carriers start to step away from their long-standing ties to uh, uh, making you buy an overpriced phone, so they can lock you down in a contract for several decades. Um, and while we're talking about cheerful news. Uh, in the wake of, I don't know if, if we don't think we got a chance to talk about it. You know, Lenovo had huge layoffs, like, you know, 50% of their non manufacturing staff, which is apparently several thousand jobs. Yeah. Um, but uh, GPU shipments are down from last year. PC industry drops 10%. That was from uh, uh, NPD research. You know, uh, Sebastian noted on PC per not all that surprising, uh, given that more and more people are doing their computing on tablets and phones. Um, but uh, AMD, 10.7% of the market. Intel, 75%. NVIDIA, 14%. And, of course, the Intel, 75%. Uh, are there, you know, system on a chip or, or uh, uh, you know, the GPU that comes on their CPU. But that's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of laptops. So, um, yeah. yeah, you know, 10% down year to year. So... We may be covering more cell phones and tablets. <laughs> <laughs> or at least trying to. Um, Seems like and more. It's, I, know, I know people have heard us talk about uh, liquid nitrogen overclocking. Some people have, have may even seen me do it in a previous life. Uh, <laughs> I found this link up on Hard OCP. Uh, it's technolo technologyx.com. It's a website I've never been up to before. A beginner's guide to, to liquid nitrogen benchmarking sub-zero huh. series. 
quote, if you are reading this and maybe you're ready to make the jump into sub-zero benchmarking or just enter it in a simple how-to, sub-zero benchmarking is where you use liquid nitrogen, dry ice, uh, phage chains units, or even for those daring enough, liquid helium, which is really scary to me. The main focus of our guide is to show you what you need to start on LN2 or DICE. We will look at what is needed and some terminology on CPU and GPU uh, over sub-zero overclocking and benchmarking. So if you've seen these like ridiculous scores, you know, like I have this processor, but this benchmark on this website is 42 times what my processor runs at. They're probably running uh, liquid nitrogen or possibly dry ice. It's an interesting read. Uh, if, you know, if you've never done something like this, it's kind of fascinating to realize just exactly how unhinged uh, it has to be because Yoshi and I back on the screen there was about a billion years ago built our own, what they now called a pot, which is the container you put... Um, you know, we had to have a bunch of copper welded together to create something we could attach to the top of a PC. But now you can get like these crazy kingpin cooling pots, which are kind of gorgeous and available with, you know, uh, all sorts of stylish uh, designs. Or, uh, But you're looking at like $240, uh, which is a lot more expensive than just welding a piece of copper pipe onto a copper cooler, but probably much uh, more yeah. sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, let's jump to a couple of questions. Rogers K24 tweets at Ryan Schrott at Patrick Norton question for Twitch. How do NVMe SSDs in a Skylake system impact gaming? Any worry of less PCI express lanes for the GPU? And the short answer is since they put all of the available GPU layer or the PCI express lanes in North America available in Skylake, there should not be an issue or do I completely have that wrong? No. So, I mean, um, if you are using one of the two primary PCI Express, so if you use one of the primary PCI Express slots for a graphics card, mm -hmm. you get 16 lanes of PCI Express. If you use the second one for a PCI Express SSD, then eight lanes, it's divided into eight lanes for the GPU and eight lanes for the SSD. And that's actually just fine. Like eight lanes is plenty for the graphics card. Um, and eight lanes is more than enough for any PCI SSD uh, today. The... Uh, if you have more than one graphics card, if you're running SLI or Crossfire, so you occupy both um, primary slots with the uh, with the GPUs, then you got to use one of the third slots that comes off of the chipset uh, with which should be fine, right? So right. what's interesting is Skylake now has PCI Express 3.0 uh, by four options on it. Uh, and previous to that, you have around PCI Express 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's a little bit of limitation there in terms of it, it by bottleneck things, but it's not going to affect, um, like it's not going to detriment, detrimentally affect your, your gaming or anything like that. No, I, if anything else, it will actually improve it with, uh, with the, with the faster storage capability. It's a good thing. Yeah. And one last question before we go. At Tom, Tom Arbuthnot tweets at Patrick Norton at Ryan Shroud. Hi, guys. Love Twitch. Any news on 16 gigabyte DDR4 modules to max out Skylake motherboards to 64 gigabytes with four DIMMs? And last I saw, they were pretty mm -hmm. impossible to find. Um, in part because every time you search for 16 gigabyte DDR4, you get 16 gigabyte DDR4 kits. Uh, I don't <laughs> think th I. Th I th I'm pretty sure those. I'm pretty sure those don't exist yet. Yeah. Um, Just for fun. Computer memory capacity 120 gigabytes. No, I guess up. they do. Crucial has oh, some. Eight by, oh, eight by sixteen G Skill Ripjaw Series Four. That's a mere two thousand and sixty five dollars. Um, uh, eight by six. It's funny that they're selling these like eight by sixteen kits. Perhaps I should back things down a little bit. So um, crucial seems like they have one that's rated at twenty one hundred thirty three megahertz. It's a yeah. DDR four sixteen gig dim. It's ECC registered. That's kind of where the the bottleneck's going to be, right? It's only one hundred seventy dollars right. for one sixteen gig dim. That seems so uh, but I I don't I bet you can't find that unbuffered unregistered. Yeah, ECC registered. Yeah. A lot easier to find 4x8 kits. Huh. Yeah, there should be a lot of 4x8 kits out there. But, yeah. I, I, I think that's kind of like right on the edge of, of, of technology, right. what technology is capable of right now. 
Um, I'd wait a little bit. I mean, we, yeah. we, I guess I've seen 64 gig memory kits, but they tend to be eight by eight for right. Haswell E, right? That's, that's usually where I, where I'm seeing that at. So I don't, I don't, a, I'm not, I'm looking here and I don't really see mm -hmm. anything with that. That's in a, a, a four by eight or no wait, a four by 16 kit or anything either. So. Yeah, I mean, four by four, 16 gigabyte kits, single sticks or eight gigabyte or, you know, 50 bucks or eight gigabytes, eight gigabytes. <laughs> yeah, the point of selling a sort of a, you know, collection of four gigabyte drives instead of a single eight gigabyte sticks kind of silly. But uh, yeah, well. let's see. Corsair did announce, I remember that back in the early part of the summer, uh, two 128 gig DDR4 RAM kits right. um, that were. 8 16 gig yeah 8 16 gig modules huh. um I, I if i'm trying to remember now i think they were like yeah uh <clears throat> they were running uh $2100 <laughs> when right. they launched <laughs> yeah there you go 8 by 16 gig 1700 bucks so if you maybe had a friend that wanted that much <laughs> memory too that you could split if you only want four of those modules oh, wait Wait, 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 wait. Newegg has two, two separate SKUs for Corsair's Vengeance 2x16 gigabyte DDR4, uh, yeah. which are both out of stock, but they sell <laughs> for 265 about 265 bucks. Um, okay. Yeah. And there is one review, and... Uh, try as I might. Oh, wait. Hold on. Wait for it. Wait for I'm it. I'm waiting. Hmm. No? Apparently, he had trouble getting it to boot with his X99 ASRock motherboard. Yeah, you do need to, like, the motherboard's going to have to have pretty specific support right. for stuff like that. So, I'd, I'd look into... What what dims have even been qualified, or even email yeah. the support for your motherboard manufacturer before you you make that purchase? I mean, not if you can return it later, it's not the biggest deal. But yeah. yeah, it's yeah. funny that there are a ton of of 128 gigabyte kits in stock, but no uh, 32 <laughs> kits. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, if you're gonna get 16 gig dims, you're probably want 128 gigs of memory, right? Yeah. I mean, They're a little more expensive when you buy them in packs of 12 instead of packs of two. That's the thing that cracks me up. True. In any case, I just want to throw out props for Newegg for the ability to sort through the capacity and choose the multiplier and the size That's of good point. the DM you want to purchase. Yep. That's pretty useful in times like this. Yeah. So hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you found this a useful episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. As usual, you can find Mr. Ryan Shrout at... Ryan Shrout or at PCPer.com where he is furiously bench working in between the glories of changing diapers and uh, investigating new and exciting levels of sleep deprivation. <laughs> Look at that excitement. I, I, that is very much true. Like I was at IDF and uh, very few work trips. I'm like, man, I'm going to go back to the hotel and go to bed early. Uh, but I definitely took advantage of that uh, in this my instance both times. My first trip to CES... Um, a friend of mine uh, laughed and said, this is going to be the best CES ever because you're going to get to CES. You're going to be like, I'm in Las Vegas. I'm going to sleep eight hours tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what it was like. And it's I like oh, man, is that 1030? Oof. Okay, let's see. Good night. I woke up at 530 in the morning just as if I had been in the house with a little tyke, <laughs> uh, which made me laugh. And then I had a breakfast in a very empty room in, the, uh, in Las Vegas. But... I'm Patrick Norton at Patrick Norton on Twitter. And uh, of course, I make a show called Tech Thing, T E K T H I N G dot com with Shannon Morse. And uh, we talk about computers and technology and GPS and cameras and basically stuff. Uh, and occasionally, you, actually, a lot in the last episode. There were several minutes at the end of the last episode where we talked about ukuleles. But uh, we got the new Leva X2 review up. Shannon's got a new uh, alarm system, a Wi Fi based alarm system, and uh, more you can find there. So that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrupp. See you next week. Bye.